Okay. Um, it's Hollywood Squares time. Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the March 2024 meeting of the Racial Disparities in the Criminal and Juvenile Justice System Advisory Panel. Um, I'll do the Hollywood Squares thing and go around. And when I call on you, please introduce yourself and tell us, you know, something interesting. Grant. Hi, I'm Grant Taylor, taking minutes for the group. Wonderful. Thank you. Erin? Okay. Hi, everyone. Took me a second to find the unmute. Erin Jacobson for the Attorney General's Office. Great. Reverend Hughes. Mark Hughes, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening his... Tyler. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tyler Allen. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I am uh, the commissioner designated appointee from DCF. It's good to see everybody. Yes. Rebecca. Uh, hi, everyone. Rebecca Turner, Defender General's Office. Great. Tim. Oh, there you go. Um, Tim Leaders Dumont, Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. And I just wanted to let everyone know, I'll, I'll talk more about it later, but this will be my last meeting as the appointee for the department. Uh, Farzana Leva from Orleans will be the new appointee, but I'll still attend and, and be a proxy where, where needed. Um, so, so, you know, I didn't get disappeared. I'm just uh, trying not to spread so thin and still going to work as closely as possible with our fearless chair. So good to see everybody. Okay. Thank you. Jen Furpo. Hey, Jen Furpo. I'm the designee for the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Great. Thank you. Jack Rose. Hi, thanks. Yeah, I go by Jack. So thanks for that. I'm she, her pronouns. Um, I and with the Department of Corrections, I'm the Health Equity Program Director, and I am not the appointee. Derek is, so I'll let him introduce himself. Okay, thank you. Laura Carter. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. I am a data analyst in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics, which is in the Office of Racial Equity. Great. Sheila. Good evening, everyone. Sheila Linton, she, her pronouns, uh, panel member and executive director and founder of the Root Social Justice Center. Okay. Thank you. Derek. Hi, good evening, folks. Sorry to hop on a couple minutes late and I'm in my car, so I'm going to go off video in a moment while I drive <laughs> myself home. But Derek Miedovnik, I uh, represent the Department of Corrections and my role there is the community and restorative justice executive. Dan Bennett. Dan. Okay. Um, Tiffany. Hi there. Uh, data manager for the Office of Racial Equity. I'm happy to be here tonight. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure who Isaac is, whose otter pilot is here. If you're hearing me, which He's you're one probably... of ours. Uh, Isaac is the uh, community engagement and support director for the, for the Alliance. Oh, thank you. Okay. And then I'll try once again, Dan Bennett. And that's that. Okay. Um, oh, he said he gave his intro and it sounds like nothing came through, but he's here. Um, it's the internet. <laughs> Being the internet. Never mind. Hi, Dan. Um, okay. Um, introductions, announcements. I know um Judge Morrissey will not be here. Jessica Brown will not be here, and Susanna will not be here this evening. Everybody has their things they need to do. So those are those announcements. The second list of announcements that I have is, I forgot to put in the um, approval of the minutes. Sorry. <laughs> and, Aaron, uh, you look like you've got a question. 
I'm counting to make sure we have quorum. Oh. I thought we did. Well, I'm counting. Hold on. Okay. Carry on. I'll just keep counting. There are eight. I nine. think we need nine. Are there nine? nine? Yeah. Okay. All right. There are nine. Um, so, yes. Um, Tim? Oh, as to the minutes. Um, oh, okay. Let's oh, go. If that, if that yeah. works for you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. It, I, you're, 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 go for it. Um, on the fourth vote, which actually had to do with second look, um, I voted no. And um, I think it was just a, a Scrivener's um, error, but it, it was recorded as yes in the minutes. So with that change, um, I would be in favor of uh, approval of the minutes as long as that change were included. Oh, okay. Anyone seconding? More discussion? No? Okay, let's take a vote. I'm, I'm happy uh, to second that, uh, okay. given, given what uh, Tim already identified. As a Great. Change. Anything else? Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, signify in some interesting way. Aye. 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 All opposed? Great. Abs all abstaining. Minutes are approved with that one um, correction. Thank you. Um, that didn't take long. All right. Um, plunging right in. Um, as some of you may remember um, from the voting last time, I was rather concerned by the fact that there were three large governmental organizations that did either a, a, a an abstention over an entire section of the report or of the entire report. Um, that concerns me because it then becomes, at least in my mind, hello? Jennifer, you're not on mute, just so you know. I am sorry, just trying to direct my kids as to oh. how to eat, so I'll go on mute. My apologies. <laughs> it's dinner yeah. time at the Pullman home. <laughs> Eating is, yeah, it's very critical. Um, so anyway, I was concerned by that because what it turns the RDAP into is a body that doesn't seem to be a lot more than some silent governmental actors and community members. And if you'll remember, I made that comment last time and that grew on me as time went on and it led me to write a letter now. Having said that, this letter is not from the panel. It's from me. It's from the chair. Um, and it will go to all of the commissioners for whom you are proxies, some many of you, and the attorney general, um, because I think it addresses some really root issues that are critical to the future relevance of this panel and its functioning. And so I just want to read you that letter now. I would have sent it, but there are those uh, those open meeting laws which kind of militate against that. So dear whatever, commissioner, et cetera. Firstly, it is critical that everyone understands that I am speaking structurally and am manifestly not speaking of individuals. The issue at hand is systemic. It thus involves all of us and not as individual, but rather as players in an ugly epic drama that has been going on for a millennium or so. Recently, as you know, the RDAP completed its statutorily required report on racial disparities in the adult criminal and juvenile justice systems. This report was primarily approached by way of three subcommittees which met during uh, and during our open warn meetings conveyed their work to the entire body for discussion and contemplation. The process was arduous and imperfect and yet resulted in an exhaustive, doubtless some truly hopeful people will say exhausting, document. 
When the RDAP last met, our primary order of business was to vote on the individual questions raised in the report. This is not an unusual process for this body. At the end of the voting, what struck me very unpleasantly was the fact that two governmental organs and one which abstained from voting on, full, on fully a discrete third of the report, all frankly hugely influential governmental organs approached the voting with a blanket abstention. I will be plangently clear. Abstention is not the problem. A blanket abstention in which a given supposedly involved agency takes no position on a vast section of or anything in a report is. Three governmental organs did precisely this. In effect, at the moment when participation mattered the most, these three bodies with tremendous power decided not to participate. I publicly noted this at the meeting and not with pleasure. The true beauty of the RDAP is the interaction of community members, actual thought leaders in their communities with people who not only participate in, but are literally constitutive of state government. The point is to attack racial disparities. Discussion is the tool by which this task is approached, and it is vital to understand that discussion is a dialectical activity. The word dialectical refers to the fact that all who speak with one another may in fact be moved by one another and perhaps even moved to adopt an unfamiliar position on a given matter that they did not originally profess. This happens to me all the time. When I get into my fascist mode, one member of the panel in particular brings me back from the brink and reminds me of my humanity just so you all know it, Sheila. Um, if those discussions do not take place, then I submit that there is simply no point in having the RDAP at all. The panel becomes little more than a checked box that says that the state wants people to believe that it is working on racial equity. People of color are used to seeing that ultimately meaningless checked box and further to seeing that simple acknowledgement does not equal hard and uncomfortable work. But blanket abstentions rather deny that discussion in all of its dialectical glory happened at RDAP meetings at all. In the final analysis, which is the report itself, these disengagements suggest that three major governmental organs simply have a limited amount or indeed nothing to say rather a depressing conclusion after roughly a year and a half of hard work. I do understand and please continue to think structurally. Even those who presented a blanket abstention operated not out of malice, but rather out of an understanding of some notion of a standard operating procedure that has worked for them over the years. The issue is this. Systemic racism always lies in the interstices of standard operating procedure. And the use of that procedure can and did have unintended consequences that simply reinforce certain elements of racism that we are clearly trying to eradicate. The community members on the RDAP all took positions, not on every question, but certainly on most. Several governmental bodies did the same. And as I've noted, other major players in the state simply said officially nothing. And they did so with what must surely have seemed good reason. But here are the unintended consequences of that act. I can only speak for myself, but as a person of color who serves on the RDAP, not merely as chair, but also as a community member, the blanket abstentions made me feel a bit like a performing monkey like tinted window, dre window dressing, who helped to check that all important box that says, quote, we in Vermont are doing our equity work, unquote. I am frankly not at all certain of how or if the blanket abstentions affect the usefulness of our work. I am also utterly unclear about what makes this document any different from what any citizen might say to their legislators with the hope that some legislation might result. Once again, this utterly delegitimizes the work of the RDAP in light of how it is constituted. 
I would submit that we're not doing our collective equity work if important parts of state government simply decide to take themselves out of the equation and even more importantly, out of the discussion. It does structurally turn the community members on the panel into little more than privileged member performers with opinions. Sadly, this has happened all too often with many different kinds of government over the decades and people of color are well, well aware of this. It doesn't feel good, it hurts. One can easily feel used to support standard operating procedure and thus in many cases, racial erasure itself. This is staggeringly at direct odds with the stated goal of the RDAP. I do not know what the solution to this thorny problem is. I do know that standard operating procedure cannot reliably be used to attack systemic racial problems. I hope that my letter can point to the need to have some conversations, dialectical, possibly thought changing, that can produce a far better result than what we got with this newest report. Those proposed conversations are, in my view, essential to the future relevance and functioning of the RDAP. And in that spirit, I write, hoping that we all can move our organizational practice into a more descriptive and participatory space. We won't immediately abolish racial bias, but at least then, we'll have a better chance of doing so collaboratively as a group. Love and kisses, Eitan. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Um, I, that sums up where I'm at. You're I was welcome. Troubled. Thank you. You're more than welcome. You're more than welcome. I, I was troubled. Um, and I do think that it is in, uh, part of my job uh, to be the chair is to protect this body. And if something seems off, I am obliged, because you voted me chair, I am obliged to take care of it. And so this will go out in the morning um, to all of the commissioners. I, I'm not, you notice I don't name names, not playing that game. I'm talking about a structure that's far more important because that's what's going on here. Um, and so it will go out to all of the commissioners that we all represent, many of us do, and that will be that. So I just wanted to read that to you um, and just so you know where we're at. Any questions, anything else that uh, I can answer for you? Thank you for sharing that, Mr. Chair. I thought it was uh, written um, with an incredible amount of respect and poise and also with the right amount of bluntness um, to the points you're trying to get across. So I, I thought it was incredibly well uh, spoken as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, then. Uh, Aaron. Hey, Tom. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was things. just, while, while we're going around, I just want to take a moment to appreciate you as well. I thought that was very well written. I agree with what Tim said. Uh, I think there's a great deal of poise in there and elegance in the way you're writing, which is standard from you. I do appreciate that. Um, uh, so, and I think that'll be, it'll be a, a, a valuable message to, you know, for my commissioner to hear and for others to hear. So I, I appreciate your putting it out there. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Sheila. Oh, and then Aaron. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Aaron. You first. You were first. Okay. Thanks, Sheila. Um, Aton, thank you so much for writing that. Uh, I, th I think you have to be courageous to do it and I appreciate it. And um, I, well, one thing I want to acknowledge at the top is that I, I think about this a lot. I think in terms of, you know, who silence favors, I think if, if silence is comfortable for you, you're probably privileged. If the well silence said. makes you uncomfortable, it's probably because you're not privileged. Mm -hmm. And I want to apologize for the role I played in um, the attorney general's office um, abstaining on the community oversight of policing recommendations. I want to explain what my role was that I'm apologizing for. That is that I did not effectively communicate with the attorney general um, 
about it, some of the content of those recommendations. It was a lot. It was a lengthy part of the report. And I just think I wasn't an, as effective a, a communicator as I could have been. Um, some of the reasons that my office abstained were simply about the amount of time that we had to review the recommendations, which wasn't much. And I'm not saying this to make excuses. I'm yeah. saying it because that to me means I just should have tried harder. And I, and I, I think I probably felt comfortable with the abstention because it meant that, well, at least we weren't undermining those recommendations. That's not true. That's untrue. That's false. And I, and that's a regrettable thing that I thought, and I'm sorry. Um, I think Thanks, one Mary. one really important part of the the statement that you made, Aton, is that um, you said something like, "I'm not sure what the solution to this problem is," but I would say that if we're not going to talk about solutions tonight, I hope that we can at a future meeting. Yes, I absolutely. do have some ideas for how we could have a better process that that makes it um, easier for government engagement and that makes government engagement more fulsome. Um, and also, obviously, I think this letter is part of the solution. I think it's it sends a really clear, loud, important message. Um, and so with that, I'll, I just want to reiterate my gratitude to you, Aton, and, and to this whole panel. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks very much for Sheila, I'm I I got all twisted up. You're <laughs> that's what's up. Thank you. Um, I'm just delighted to have you as our chair and for you to just keep it real. Um, I had some both somatic feelings um upon voting as well as some afterthoughts. And I would like to continue this conversation as yes. well. I um I do have my comment is is that. I have some concerns as well. And some of those concerns are around timing and are around um, delegation. And I feel as though, you know, um, myself as a community member who also sit on a subcommittee, who also helped write reports, right. who also did a huge body of work for no pay or very little, right. um, um, had very limited time. <laughs> and I'm, yeah. not, I'm not at the table getting paid to, to be here. And I also want to say that I think that when we have certain people who are delegated to represent certain entities and that person isn't necessarily consistent for a long time, I think that we should work on that. Like it should be like at least a year or some type of commitment because sometimes I forget who is who because it's like there's a proxy. I don't get a proxy. Right. And I just think it's an issue that we need to be talking about with the people who are not community members. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation when we okay. um, have that conversation, because I think it's a real concern for me. I'm top of the top of uh, the next uh, agenda is this discussion. Um, anybody else? Uh, Derek and then Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Yeah, I'm just still metabolizing that beautiful and necessary piece of work and the fucking emotional labor that you had to do to produce it, Eitan, and forgive me, but I, I just... I know, you're upset. I get it. And I appreciate your concern. I, I, I just, I, I, I just want to just make a public statement of my love for you <laughs> um and um oh. I, I um i'm i'm so thankful that you are and everybody who's who's on this but i am addressing this you know to and hopefully with you on um i'm so thankful that you are willing to double down and double down again on that unassailable sense of dignity that is intrinsic and continue to put the attention on the structures that attempt intentionally and or otherwise to continue 
at large to try to undermine that. Um, you know, I think folks understand I'm the DOC representative. We were one of, I think, the two agencies that just made black and blanket extem- uh, abstentions. Um, Aaron, I really appreciated your thoughts because they also led me to reflect on whether or not there was more in my role as a designee to the Department of Corrections that I could do to have the Department of Corrections understand that these were recommendations of essentially like strategies within topical focal areas that in a report, like they were, they were layers down in the political rarefied air of, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to say legislation, they, they don't, preclude any executive branch institution from testifying on behalf of that institution. And so I'd say the self-reflective and hopefully constructive part of me just kept wondering, like, is there more I can do in my role? And is there more we can do as a panel to differentiate the role of designees to the panel relative to institutions when they show up in the body politics, such as the legislature, to to testify? And, and, and my answer for me is probably yes. There's probably more I can do, or at least attempt to do. So thank you for that, Erin. And I'm just really appreciative, uh, Eitan, that you once again show up so entirely with like such staggering authenticity and it's humbling and we are just beyond lucky that you are just a friend and a colleague and have taken up the mantle of leadership and so i thank you and i'm proud to be in this conversation so thanks thank you okay rebecca So I, I I wanna I too wanna join um, my gratitude to you, Aton, for doing this on behalf of Aloha and yourself, but specifically as chair for RDAP, specifically because you felt obligated that it it impacted the very essence of what we are about. And so I want to talk to about that for a moment. Uh Aaron, thanks for um for what I heard was that you you took a lot of personal responsibility in that I think what my where I'm at having been very much involved in um very much on one subcommittee I would, did not carry the heavy weight on that second subcommittee uh, I well, Tyler and and Elizabeth did that on the juvenile justice but certainly in involved the fact that we did this for the, over the course of a year, granted, we didn't get the final draft of the report until the end. And I understand time issues. I understand the explanations that are said here. I think for me, what I really appreciate your letter to be, Aton, particularly in this moment going to agenda item next, <laughs> is that two yeah. or three, uh, is that I fundamentally don't I don't know what the role of RDAP is. Mm -hmm. So we are, we have submitted a report. We are in the process of self-reflection on on this one particular point, and I think it's critical, but it speaks to a larger, a larger question in my mind. Our creation was always so broad. We set forth last year to go forward with what we thought were priority items that we got into this report. And here we are almost at crossover at the legislative session uh, where we are getting um, requests here and there from specific legislators. There are a number of us who are in there regularly testifying specific bills. Um, I'm in there on particular bills raising the flag about the racial disparate impact and the need to bring in community voices time and time again, and it's not happening. And we'll talk about that, but my, I think, what I hope we do next with this most recent experience, sort of this moment of reflection as to why are we here? What is the use of us? 
if what we do once a month and more for those who work on the subcommittees is to just submit a report to what end? For what purpose? And so whether it's the next agenda item, I think that fundamental to me coming out of these sort of the, the past reports, this most recent report, this legislative session, I think a question for me is what we should ask ourselves is what are we here for? What, how can we be most effective? Perhaps if, if the question is, is how to bridge the pipeline, whatever the, that, how you put it, Aton, in the agenda in terms of, is it, is it providing racial uh, impact statements to the legislature? Is it to provide whatever else? Um, it is- How um, to get a functional pipeline between the legislature and the RDAP. Again, I, I'm uh, I'm merging issues, but just a general comment that I'm at a place of of general frustration because on one front I'm seeing at, at the legislative session this year astoundingly scary bills being introduced and rushed and uh, nearing the end zone for voting on one side uh, of the chamber without any input from community members on uh, bills that I think will have racial impact. So I'll just stop there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mark, Mark. Eitan, I appreciate you. Thank you, Mark. A lot. I appreciate you a lot. I uh, just wanted to just uh, really echo what um, Rebecca and some of the others were saying <clears throat> and um, you know, quite frankly and respectfully, just, you know, I take some of the comments and, and some of the attitudes with mostly some of our uh, appointees, our elect, our state appointees as being largely perfunctory. Um, just because I can say that, um, because I, because I watched the whole thing uh, play out last week as well. And um, I want to give a special shout out to the tenacity and um, and also the persistence of Rebecca Turner and Sheila Linton, uh, who've been here since day one uh, and watched this thing play out and know that um, my departure is, was directly related to the exact struggle uh, that you're endeavoring right now. So it's, this is incredibly meaningful to me personally, especially all of the time and effort that it took to actually um, to move forward Act 54 uh, in 2017 and get the work done uh, and, and to establish this, this group. Yeah. Uh, we did that. We did that. And uh, that's why you're here. And I think that um, the, um, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of frustration over the years. I think it's been over six years now Yeah. Uh, since you've been in place. But um, instead of making it into a, you know, a really long like lecture or anything like that, just to get practical. I would just say that, um, you know, what we're, what we're seeing is we're just seeing the, the growing pains of something that was yes. really never fundamentally designed to do what it is that we thought it was, uh, hope that we hoped it to do, that we hoped it would do. Uh, in fact, what we asked for is oversight. And I know that scares the hell out of everybody on the call. Most, most of you who are, uh, we asked for oversight. This is what we got. Um, but you know how sausage is made in the legislature. Um, and I would just say that um, there's a lot of structural challenges uh, with what it is that you're doing. Um, and, you know, we should be contemplating going back in and, and maybe um, restructuring um, some of, uh, you know, the enabling statute uh, yeah. to be able to, uh, to, to, to give this this panel the power to do what it is that it right. was in originally uh, commissioned to do, uh, and that now, they've grown to, they may have like not wanted it at first, mm -hmm. but they grew to wanting it to do even more. Yeah, I had an extensive <laughs> conversation with Coach yesterday on that very point, and um, so yeah, I mean, so it's 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 frustrating, and, and it's it's also frustrating to even the, the appointees that are um, that are here, you know, if it were up to me, I'd, I'd have like Charity and Nick and Chris and Matt and John and Tom and Jen uh, be required to show up at one of these meetings or two of these meetings a year or something like that. I don't know, 
what that looks like uh, in others. Uh, but yeah, I'd have them show up and, and, and have them sit in that seat and have them take the vote. And, uh, and, and maybe what that would do is it would disconnect Tyler and Tim and Derek and others and Aaron and others, uh, because um, frankly, uh, politically and economically, you are captive and that's just how it is. And it's not your fault, you know, and it's not because you're bad people or anything like that. It's just, this is the way it is. And this is your quiescent state. This is how it operates. Um, and I think that that's, that's a reality that we have to talk about. And, but I think there, there are larger implications and I promise I won't be very much longer, but, um, I just, you know, I just really want to, you know, focus back on what Rebecca was saying a minute ago, and she really is my favorite of the folks here, you know, um, her and Sheila. Um, but, you know, it's just, a, there's a massacre going on in judiciary and House and Senate right now. And they're currently walking back um, a lot of the criminal justice reform in, in a lot of the, um, the, the uh, what we called um, reinvestment and and, and they're doing it, a lot of it is, is fear mongering in, in dog whistles that are happening. That's really uh, rolling, that's really, and, I mean, and, and re when you're making policy decisions, these knee jerk policy re decisions out of, um, out of fear and just out of just this, this spontaneity, because there's this sense of urgency because everybody's not safe and we gotta do this now. It's just not gonna work. Um, and what's What's um, more frightening about it is, is at the same time, when you look at human services and you start talking about the, the equity lens or lack thereof, that we're rolling out um, prevention as well as um, mental health and other social programs, we're not even ensuring that the, there's equitable access for black and brown and, and marginalized communities on that front. So all of this stuff is going on at the same time. And um, finally, what I would strongly encourage, you know, if it were my world for like another 15 minutes, would be if the legislature, if judiciary would consider just maybe not stopping everything, but just the implement the implementation dates of a lot of this policy. What if we were able to just let everything cool off after this session, bring in some independent third party or something and just do a, a global scope analysis of what the, com the combination of all of these changes are doing because we all know this is a system and everything that happens downstream affects us upstream. And the concern is, is that there may be some unforeseen consequences in a lot of these policy changes that are going to manifest themselves. And when they touch the lives of the people that they touch, a lot of it is going to be irrevocable. And that's people's lives, black and brown and marginalized communities. So this is serious business. Yeah. And there are people who are sitting on this panel who are in those committees and testifying to that work. And that's what frustrates the heck out of me. Um, and at the same time, we're doing that. If we were able to be able to refocus our racial lens on um, prevention as well as mental mental health uh, with the same intensity that we're doing it um, as as a necessity, but but just doing it through an equity lens. Um, if we're if we're able to do that during that that cooling off, if you will, period, maybe we might be able to get through this. Uh, and and not really create a destabilization that's going to in fact impact people's lives for generations to come. But just as sure as we're all here, I'm pretty sure what we're doing collectively, um, what's getting ready to come out of the House and what's getting ready to come out of the Senate Judiciary, and when they cross over, when they all graduate and grow up to be laws, that it's going to cause a lot of havoc, and that falls on this body. That's what this body was intended to do was to head stuff off like that. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Chris Loris is here. He just sort of showed up a little late, but anyway, he didn't introduce himself, but there he is. Hi, Chris, and he has his hand up.
You don't mean to have your hand up, do you? Because we can't hear you. You got to love technology. Here we all are being highfalutin and we can't push buttons. I love it. There. Uh, you got me? <laughs> yes. So I do apologize uh, um, that I wasn't here for the introductions. So I'll introduce myself again, Aton. Thank you for that. Uh, Christopher Loris. Um, Y'all have seen me showing up here once in a while. Uh, either wearing or attesting to wearing the hat of either Criminal Justice Council or uh, Crime Research Group. And just wanted to share with y'all that um, I didn't come here to tell you that I was no longer on the Criminal Justice Council, nor am I any longer an employee with Crime Research Group. Those are just, again, asides to let you know who I am, where I am. But just... Um, saw something dumped into my email from Mark Hughes about the meeting. I was like, crud, meeting's going on. And so now just good old civilian Christopher Loris from Rutland, who started his public service career in the city of Rutland back in 1995. I just want to share with this group one thing. It looks like it's kind of timely given the conversation I walked into uh, when I joined y'all. And um, I did not see the letter that you folks have been referencing re that that Aton had written, and I then and that actually makes what I'm going to tell you all uh, that much better. I'm sorry, I'm shivering. I've been outside in the no jacket, and <laughs> the sun's going down here in Rutland. Um, I just want to share with with all you folks that in the 30 years of public service I've had in Vermont at local level, state level. As I said, the latest thing was Vermont Criminal Justice Council, just finished a three-year gig there as a gubernatorial appointee. And I need to share that um, watching your group just outside looking in, because I was there and only as an observer, never as a participant, I can tell you that RDAP by far and I mean by by a great margin over whatever the second committee council I've ever seen act. But you guys um, have been the most impactful and most productive council, board, commission, committee, division, alderman, city council that I've ever witnessed in my 30 years. And uh, it's because of the passion you bring to whatever you're doing here. It translates to action that I, in a way, I haven't seen out of any other work group since I've been doing this stuff. Um, so you guys are top notch. You're in the right for the right reasons. And you, you may not feel like you accomplished a lot, but I've been watching stuff for a long time in the state of Vermont you've accomplished a lot as a small group with what you've put into this. And I've told Aton this one-on-one, -on -one, so I'm going to say it in front of y'all. Um, and it's a testament to, to, to Aton. Um, I have learned so much just watching this cat over the last three years. Um, and here I am, you know, an old turd who thought I couldn't learn anything else from public service and watching other people. And this guy showed me how to lead a group. So, Aton, thank you for that, personally. And you guys keep having the conversations you're having because I think you're going to be just as impactful as a group starting from now going forward. And, um, so Godspeed to you. I'm sorry I got to cut and run, but uh, I've got to be at a some very, very good friends of mine, uh, Syrian family that's down here in Runton, lives a few blocks away. Um, I've got to go break fast with them because I'm following in the footsteps of Curtis Reed, and 
uh, honoring and celebrating the month of Ramadan with um, with my friends. So, Aton, love you, buddy. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That was a paid for political announcement. I was feeling this. I was absolutely devastated one day and I paid him to say that. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. I, you know, I think we're, we're just, we're going through, I think Mark hit it. We're on, we're growing. It's growing pains. It's growing pains. And I, I will move through it. Um, you know, Mark said things don't change unless there's conflict. And there's, you know, and here we are. And here we are. And I really think, I, I do believe that. And I think this will bring us to some really good spots. Um, and I think it'll get even better because Rebecca's going to talk to us about some ideas, maybe some ways to even start a discussion about this pipeline thing from the legislature to us. Because at, because as Mark was just pointing out, we were supposed to get these bills at some point way before it got to this point. And it didn't. It didn't. And there are a bunch of them this this session. I, I, I keep hearing about new ones every damn day. Um, That's got to improve. We've mentioned that as a panel. We've talked about that. We talked about it last session. You know, that that wasn't going to happen again. And uh, here we are. Um, interesting what panic will do, won't it? You know? Um, so anyway, Rebecca, the floor is yours. Sorry. Where to start? I think instead of talking about all the bills <laughs> <laughs> that, that I think could rather than I'll, I'll start with two that I saw your name attached to on behalf of RDAP on the agendas for House Judiciary. I believe they're both in House Judiciary Committee this week. Yes. I'm excited to speak on two bills, and I believe it's H655. Is that yeah. right? Relating to uh, related to a substantial overhaul of our expungement slash sealing laws. And when I say substantial overhaul, I'm saying the elimination of expungements and changing it to a sealant. But that's tomorrow, I think, Eitan. Is that right? Yes. And I guess I read that very, very badly. And then there is a second one I saw your name on. 176, which is about traffic, secondary enforcement of um, traffic motor vehicle violations. And that was referenced in our report uh, that we just submitted. And it was referenced in the community. Um, oh, I forget the title, Sheila, of that section that you wrote, but it was about. Uh, oh, community safety. Community yeah, safety. review. And there was a reference there. Again, I don't have the page number, but recommend recommending uh, sort of reprioritizing uh, where law enforcement traffic enforcement should be and there was a reference there to this bill right. uh, and and this is the bill that um is just being introduced in house judiciary for the first time this session i understand it was uh before transportation committee last session but there's been no testimony taken on this one coming up and that is about i think the goal is to uh, deprioritize certain traffic law enforcement uh, by way of, of trying to make it as a secondary enforcement only after another violation. Right. Uh, and and so there there's there's that. In my in my I now we're in what month of, of the session? I think this is the first possible reform uh, side of the criminal justice system bill that I, I've seen yet. Uh, there have been others that I know you've been invited to talk on our behalf, H534, relating to, the, to overhauling, at, uh, creating enhanced penalties, new offenses for retail theft. Uh, and I saw- It's about a 6-2 or something? 534, I think. And, oh, okay. 
there wasn't attending one, but I think that's now the lead that you shared with the group that seems to not have come back on the committee uh, agendas yet. And there was something else. Um, what has what has not <laughs> what I've not seen come up from your emails to us. I mean, I don't think you've been invited. Is in the Senate Judiciary Committee there are also significant bills being proposed uh, that. Um, fundamentally change, broaden the scope of, of um, crimes, and that's specifically the drug, drug code. Uh, there's a proposal there to drop the requirement that they're changing the definition of knowingly, and knowingly is a mens rea for all uh, controlled substances offenses in Title 18, misdemeanor to felony, possession to trafficking. Wherever the word knowingly is required, knowingly possess, knowingly traffic, it now can be proven without someone actually knowing, but um, kind of a, a, a should have known standard, an objective standard. Now, that's a substantial change that there is a proposal on just that, that S58, that's one. We have four sections in S58 that are, are significant. One of the additional section in there um, was something we talked about last year. This is about adding to the big 12 types of offenses where if committed um, by youth, that it has to start in criminal court. Last year, instead of instead of juvenile delinquency, last year that came up on our, our radar as, as an issue of concern. Uh, certain organizations wrote letters asking uh, the legislature to, to not pass it. Well, they didn't that session, but that has come back in S58 and it's not decreasing that list, it's adding to it. So again, the same issues that we wrote, we asked or that RDAP and other impact community members uh, expressed in terms of the racial impact that that would have uh, in a bad way, uh, is happening again, again, without anyone from Senate Judiciary asking for input from the community members. And just for the record, the Senate Judiciary has not asked the Defender General's office for our input on the substantial changes to the drug code. Uh, and so it is an, and, 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 and there's two other sections in there. I, I can't even raise the age of juvenile jurisdiction. Uh, that had been um, passed, I think, three or four years ago, Tyler, you'll remember, to, to raise the age to increase the jurisdiction of family courts for delinquency proceedings up to 20. It's been delayed uh, year after year since it was passed. I think it's three times. There's another proposal now to delay it yet again. Again, we know what that delay, who that impacts most, what 19-year-olds are not going to benefit from that yet again. Uh, and there's been um, uh, testimony from our office uh, on this and the racial disparate impact that has. And again, putting that off, again, no invitation from communities impacted from RDAP uh, to speak on that bill. Okay. I mean, this, is just, this is just a drop of what we're seeing. It is, it is when, when, we, when, when Mark talks about uh, his impressions of the bills and, and how fundamentally um, kind of a rollback on the reform that we were seeing even just last year. Yeah, I, I think it's an understatement too. I mean, it's it's extraordinary. It's really concerning for us. So, I'll. I think how do we how do we make it? I, I in there. I I see how we we at RDAP are not fundamentally structured to provide real time substantive input. These drafts. Uh, Aaron, Tim, I think H655, there was another draft this morning. Which uh, is what I read after reading two other drafts over the weekend that I was told to read. And and you have slight more advantage. Like the people who went today had to have that uh, sort of absorption and pivot to testify in the latest draft. That's It's, it's extraordinarily taxing for people who do this as a day job for government entities. Uh, so again, Increasingly, what I, I see, and, and I wish Susanna, uh, I defer to her 
in terms of her. I know she has a lot of experience in trying to push racial uh, impact statements, assessments through Vermont, whether it's at the executive level or not. But increasingly, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in what other states, what other localities have done, what legislatures have done to pass this kind of stuff, where, it, where these impact statements are coming from, how they're resourced, how they're structured, so we can give something that's meaningful and not token. I'd like to ask just generally, um, I'm I'm totally uncomfortable with this testimony I'm supposed to give tomorrow. I mean, I I'm just I feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants, literally. Would it be most useful for me to say, look, you've already heard members of the RDAP in different guises speak on these, and let's just leave it there for now. And then my sense being that. We try to get the Senate side of this after crossover that they, I mean, I, that's as good as I'm coming up with right now, folks. My head is not, okay, Tim and then Rebecca. Okay, first of all, Rebecca, I felt very seen when you said the struggle of like, you know, I, part of the thing that I sometimes struggle with is I have this amorphous, I won't call it a committee, but it's the committee of people elected to be state's attorneys that I'm always trying to coordinate with. And then these bills, sometimes 60 pages long, mm. have eight drafts. And so one time I did the math recently and it was like, since January 1st, I looked at over 2,500-ish pages. And, you know, word search is helpful, but not always. And a careful reading is always, there's no substitute for a careful reading. And um, and I think it's it's hard because, you know, this council doesn't have any full-time staff and in that way it's um i mean a time give the proper historical reference but it's it's like uh we're, we're all equal which is one of the wonderful things about our voices on the art app and the way that a ton runs these meetings but then that's also sometimes a struggle because then you know i think you mr chair sometimes feel like how do i even respond they've asked me this huge topic you know Predictably, Tim, Tim and Rebecca may have different perspectives, and that's that's healthy conflict. It does create change. I want to just emphasize that conflict and conversation does create change. Um, and sometimes I'm also like in this context as well, and without the ability to, because it's a moving. Uh, I hate to say a moving target. A lot of these bills until after crossover, but it doesn't mean that there shouldn't be a sizable opportunity to weigh in as the. Uh, bills are taking shape on both sides. So it's it's a real struggle. Um, even for me, like this is a, I have many parts of my job. This is one part of my job tracking legislation. For the state's attorneys, I then meet with my executive committee every two weeks to try to update them. Always after that meeting on Friday, all of the bills change. And then I have to like wait another two weeks to try to get in touch with them. And then we meet with the state's attorneys about twice a year, all of the state's attorneys. And so it's a struggle. Uh, Rebecca, I just I want to. It's a struggle, and I know that um, the if I had to lift up voices on this on the RDAP, it would be the community members because I am getting my opportunity on behalf of the you know state's attorneys to to say my piece and acknowledging what Marcus said, right? Like I'm I'm directed, I'm commanded to come in like pretty often on on these bills. Um, so I just want to acknowledge it's it's difficult, and I did also want to say that. Um, I, I'm trying to think about what a possible, my mind is kind of churning right now um, about what, how we can better support the chair when he gets a request too. Um, so I'm thinking about it and I want to acknowledge the fact that Rebecca, you, you highlighted the, some of the structural issues with how to respond. Is this something we should call in, ask Representative Lalonde to, and, and coach for that matter? to come in and talk about with us, how do we get this working? Because it's not working. And as Mark pointed out, that was one of the founding ideas of this body. Does that, Aaron and then Rebecca? Uh, my response to that is not going to address like, what are you supposed to say tomorrow on H655? I mean, it is crossover week. 
we are not going to fix this problem this week. It's just like no time, zero, zero hours in the day. I do think that the RDAP should have um, two things. One, resources. I think that I think that the legislature needs to provide the RDAP with some resources. Um, I think people should get paid more, and I think um, we could have like a hired researcher or something. But I would say that I also think that the RDAP should have like a legislative subcommittee, because in addition to a lot of work happening while the legislature is in session, a lot happens outside of the session, and you can if you're paying attention and you're um, you know, if you can be engaged, um, you can have these kinds of conversations with the chairs of various committees, you can be paying attention to what's coming so that we have time to plan ahead. It That's not going to be the only solution to this issue, but I do think if we have the ability to work as a panel outside of the session, ahead of the session, um, I think that's a necessity if we're going to be effective come come. January through May. Uh, Rebecca. I think it's a wonderful idea, Itana, to invite coach and the chair and someone probably from Senate Judiciary to come and, and hear for sure. But I think you have a moment this week. And I think that you can share with the committee what the frustration is here. I would add this and suggest this, and perhaps the panel can weigh in on this as to whether or not we would support Aton saying this. We are glad you are invited us. You are glad you thought of our death. We're glad you're concerned about the racial equity impact of this bill, such that you invited our death. That's the presumption there, right? We believe you should conduct a racial right, equity impact assessment of this bill and any others. We are only just made aware of some, right, based on the structure. We don't have time, the resources to provide this in this time frame, this time slot today, tomorrow, perhaps not for the rest of the session, but given the limitations. We hope Right, we we are struggling with how we can be most impactful, right? And we, we need to, and that's a larger uh, a conversation for another day. But I think that the moment, the opportunity to, to deliver this message, I think we need to make it clearly, often. And you have a moment this week, and I feel like we, I'm hearing from this panel, that we can be in agreement on that. I yeah. don't know who disagrees. Yeah. I'm perfectly up for that. <laughs> um, I, I don't know how else we get it across. And at that point, it's on the record. I would also just add, Aton, you you mentioned suggesting that you that to the committees that you have heard from certain members of the panel already. I would I would I would be careful because I think the members that the committee have heard from members of the panel aren't just government stakeholders. They are not impacted community voices, period, and certainly not the community members of the panel. So I, I just want to make sure there's not, uh, some, um, you know, anyone. Point taken. Yeah. Totally taken. Um, that's what I'll do. That's what I'll do. They'll be happy. It won't take them long. They'll be, you know, they'll be in heaven. Mark. F-35s. <clears throat> So just don't mind the background so much. If it gets too loud, I'll just come back and tell you later. I thought that was the next <laughs> agenda item. I was about to get very excited. I was about to get very excited. <laughs> you know, Tim, I, Christine and I were talking about the F-35s here, and we, we thought we would go out to the airfield and tell them we deserve to, to get a ride, like at least like once a month. Just let us in the plane. Just give us a, a little ride. Um, <clears throat> of course, Christine would, want, Christine would want to fly it, though. Um, so one of the things that um, occurred to me as y'all were talking was is that, yeah, there's some structural things that are in each one of your areas of, um, of functionality as well, you know, that you want to come back and look at. That, that's another conversation. I, di I digress. But trying to stay as focused as we can on this 
Um, I, I agree. I just, I did, this, is, this is crossover. Um, if it's a money bill, you got another week, but this is crossover. Right. And so there's, you got that, you know, there's some structural things that, you know, obviously you got to, you know, that y'all can do long term. There's some, you know, enabling statute stuff, that blah, 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 blah. I think, honestly, I think the most impactful thing, I think the most impactful thing that the RDAP could do, and then this even runs up against a little bit of a, you know, some um, conflicts, possible conflicts of interest is, is to, is to write, <clears throat> um, to write a letter not an Aton letter, but a but a uh, RDAP letter. Not to say that I didn't really enjoy Aton's letter. I thought it was awesome. It was good. But but I, <clears throat> what the letter, what I believe that letter should communicate, is is the concern that this that this um, that this committee uh, shares. Right. Um, I I don't. Let's forget about what we don't agree about. Let's talk about what we do agree on. And I, I think. Part of that is, is we, we agree that there's a breakneck speed at which these laws are coming out. Um, that's what I've heard. That's what I see. Uh, we also, we, we've established, it sounds like there's a general consensus that um, many of them are likely harmful to marginalized communities in, in some way or another. Um, I don't really think I'm pushing too hard right now. Um, and, and the other thing too is, is I don't think any of us understand what the collective impact of all of them could be. And I, and I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that I stated as, um, as a suggestion is, is, well, let's find out. Let's suggest that somehow or another, we create an apparatus to find, to find out just that, not to say that we just, you know, clog up the whole process and not, just not have the laws passed. That's not even, I mean, you can't do that, but, you, but you can delay some of their implementation. You could certainly, you could certainly, you know, because there's a, there's an implementation date on all of our policies. Um, and, and there could be, you could insert, you could recommend a, a clause maybe in that, you, that it could just say, you know, at, at such time as this analysis or this review has been done, maybe it seems like a, you know, Maybe it sounds like the old man's crazy and it's just a far-fetched idea, but we, I just refuse to sit here and believe that there's absolutely nothing that you can do. Um, I, I believe it's possible that, that this committee could send over a letter, at least with a recommendation. It's not going to, it doesn't mean they're going to take your advice. I mean, they rarely do. Um, but it could be a public statement though. It could be something that goes out, you know, I'd sign off on that. Okay. Um, th so I, that's, and, and, I, and I think also the, the whole, the point that I made about human services and the fact that there's inequities and I, Tyler, I think you probably probably see this better than anybody on this, com, uh, this committee just because of the nature of your work. Um, maybe Derek too, but the, the, the social services, there, you know, there's a gap in there. There's a safety net for some, but there's a huge gap for others. Um, and I think that could be communicated as a as a as a finding of this committee or a, or an understanding at least of this committee uh, that is a is the uh, second of the two prong um, disaster that we're headed towards. And just, you know, making an open letter, and and maybe some pe maybe some people on this uh, committee or I keep calling it a committee. I forget even I forget even what we named it. Um, racial disparities in the criminal and Console, console, you're a console. <clears throat> but maybe there's some folks that would have to abstain. Okay. I get it. I get it. But I, I do think there's something that you could do if you wanted to. Sure, if it's a letter, I I mean that's not particularly difficult. I mean, in terms of time, no. I mean, that's the easiest thing to do. Um, I mean, it doesn't mean there's a lot, not a lot more that has to be done, you know, in the short term and later on down the road. But I'm just talking about, you know, how to what can, what can you possibly do to at least try to mitigate <clears throat> this this train wreck that's getting ready to happen. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Mark. 
others. You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else on this? So just to sum up, I'm going to ask Representative, well, is this even a good time to do this? I want to ask Representative Lalonde and Christy to our next meeting to discuss this pipeline. Is that the only thing that's making me go, wait a minute, is the damned session. On the other hand, waiting until after the session means nothing happens until October, at which point it's too late again. Well, right now it's just crossover. Like the session's not over. It certainly oh. is um, an important time in which, you know, some bills could die right now. Sure. But those bills that go forward, their day in the state house is far from over. Right. Um, and I like the idea of inviting in um, Chair Lalonde um, and Coach Christie or any other House Judiciary members. But I would also say then maybe we should invite in Senate Judiciary Chair and members. Um, so not Dick himself, then uh, like Nodder. Nodder, Tanya. I mean, anyone, any of the members from both committees, um, yeah. not just one committee. Okay. Okay. So Sears. Ruth, Lalonde, and Christy, does that sound okay? And I don't know. Representative Arsenault has been showing up at our panel. I'm not sure. I, you must... might have, you might invite everybody and see who shows up. I don't know. It does. <laughs> Which I, I support the, the idea of, of inviting whomever from the committees for next month. I also support putting in writing something we could submit to the committees on behalf of RDEP as Mark, as Mark suggested. Something okay. that, again, I don't know how, how, how much, but I think there are at the most broad base level, we can get to some agreement that's consistent with the entire mission of, of RDEP. Uh, and perhaps you could, again, Natan, thank you for willing to put this draft, this initial, but maybe send it around. I don't know, get our our feedback. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. It it's, doesn't have to be very long. It's just mm -hmm. an invite with a description of what our issue is. That's all. That's fine. Um, Mark has put into the chat, invite Republicans, Norris. So, yeah. Uh Mr. Chair, I was just going to recommend chair and vice chair um, in Senate and House Judiciary, and then sort it out with them so that if they need to figure out, oh, a quorum is going to be at the RDAP, then they can figure out who's going to show up, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. That they works. Can avoid, unless, that works. unless they want to, you know, I just think they'll probably want to avoid a quorum, but they can still have some some folks that they can say. Yeah. Sure. So, okay, I will, I'll get that. that and then... I'm sorry, Eitan. That... That this is just another construct that just obstructs us from getting stuff done. That that quorum things, I understand public meeting perfect. Um, and I hate to say this to an attorney, but as long as they're not voting on anything, they can be anywhere they want to be. Yeah, no, just as a, a heads up for them, I, I I don't I don't disagree with you, you know, being at a restaurant or something like that. It's it's uh uh totally up to the the th the chairs, but I just think not inviting the vice chairs um yeah. is something that I've gotten scolded for before for doing so i just wanted to, to let you guys know <laughs> all right um aaron is it all right i hmm. i would like to start the letter and then send it around is there a problem with that we've discussed it in an open meeting Yeah, and we, I just I'm I'm not sure I'll be able <laughs> we, to we can't wordsmith collectively on a document outside of a warned meeting. Okay. Um I will do my best. I will send it to you. <laughs> if you have something to say, maybe you could say. It would be nice if the fourth sentence of the second paragraph 
conveyed the idea of, and then I'll wordsmith. I think we would all have to make sure in this meeting that that um, it's clear what you're going to be writing about. I and am then, then we all are saying, that sounds great, Aton. Um, and then I think you can send that letter out to the group. And if anybody has concerns about it, like, whoa, 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 that is not what you talked about in the meeting, Aton, they can address that with you. Great. I mm -hmm. will be writing about our difficulty getting bills with the racial equity or I'm, I'm with a, oh God, I can't talk anymore. Equity focus or with equity impact in front of the body that you wanted to have do this in a timely fashion so that we can be effective. We would like to discuss with you ways in which to improve that pipeline or indeed in some ways create it. Love your RDAP. Can we also add in this a general statement that we as a panel believe there should be a racial equity impact uh, assessment done? On all bills. Sure, on all bills. I mean, where, where, yeah. I, I, I don't know. But I think that's great. Because um, what I'm hearing you just say is, is we can't do it and we don't have the resources. But I think it's really important for us to say it should be done. We believe it should be right. done. Right. Uh, okay. We can't do it um, under this. Under Got this. it. So I'll sounds like three, like three points. Like the first yes. two you made, Aton, then Rebecca's third point. Yes. And you know, if uh, this is my last time as an appointee on the on the art app anyway, so. I think that sounds fine. Um, and then um, I just wanted to say a point actually leads loops, I think, helpfully to what a, Sheila, a point Sheila made. I'm still yeah. going to be around as staff um, for, for Zana. For Zana is on our executive committee. So in some ways, getting to your point, Mark, there'll be a more direct communique with a member who's actually my supervisor. For Zana, is my supervisor on the executive committee. All of them are sort of my bosses. And so in that, I will explain to her as well before the April meeting, some of this conversation, but in some ways me stepping back um, and, and sort of allowing someone who's in a supervisory role to come engage with the group more, I think is a, is hopefully a good thing. And I'm not going anywhere, Sheila, just seeing you know, like, I'll, I'll still do my best to show up and um, support uh, the group and, and Farzana, but um, the, uh, the executive committee, she, uh, Farzana showed an interest, the first state's attorney, I think that's ever shown an interest in actually being on, on the art app. And I wanted to encourage that. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't removed. Uh, I thought I just want to make that clear. <laughs> um, I'd like to direct your attention to the um, chat where Mark points out that the letter that I outlined with Rebecca does not, um, address any, oh, and Rebecca's agreeing here, so good. This doesn't address any attempt to avert the specific append, impending doom. Rebecca. So I would propose adding a line in there saying, until, until the, the committees receive a racial impact, equity impact assessment on these bills, we recommend what? Not you know. We recommend uh, you wait. We wait. We recommend that the committee wait until it receives a racial equity impact assessment. Yeah, and that's something I, I, as much as I appreciate the sentiment, I, I can't commit to that in, in the public meeting. I just want to be upfront. Okay. Um... Understood. And then Jennifer wrote, I'm also wondering if it would be helpful, especially for the new or new legislators, to understand the overlaps and differences with the ORE and RDAP. I think that when they reach out to ORE, they think they are checking that box, as I mentioned, the Aton mentioned. That is not okay. But I think that is not okay. But I think education is critical. It's a good point. That's an excellent point, Jennifer. Um, hey, Tom. um Yes, Mark. 
the the language that I think we just sent out in one of our um, mass mailers this afternoon was something to the effect. <clears throat> there should be an implementation okay. delay. Got it. On the okay. Criminal justice. Uh, let me if if I could just be allowed to um, continue. It says there should be an implementation delay on criminal justice reform rollbacks to allow for an outside impact assessment review to enable us to understand the totality of the collective policy changes. Huh. This will also allow for racial equity review of state in investments in systems of prevention, mental health, and other social support. Mark, question. Can you send that to me? Of course. Thank you. Rebecca. As a panel member, I, I just I want to share that I, I I like that language that Mark um, just read out loud, and I would uh, I would support having that included in the letter. I agree as a panel member. Okay, others. I wonder if we should do a vote on this because that way I could I could vote no, and it still might carry forth if that makes sense on this po one point on this one on the implementation delay. Oh, yeah. I can I just say speak, I have to speak up real quick about this. I, this is a tricky situation that I am now in. If we're going to start voting, and I want to explain why, and I'm going to use a, a specific example that you have to testify about tomorrow, Aton, which is H six five five, which is a bill that would change our record clearance laws from expungement to sealing. My goal in this bill is twofold to increase the list of qualifying crimes that you can get cleared from your record. Um, and then two is to move toward an auto, towards an automatic process. So you don't have to file a petition at all. It's just after a certain number of, of years, your record is cleared. To me, in my mind, I thought that would be an access to justice benefit including for marginalized or underserved groups, because some of the crimes that are added to the list are felony, drug, um, uh, drug sales, dispensing, and transportation offenses that we all know from the CRG report are disproportionately um, um, uh, offenses charged against Black and Brown people. So in my mind, I was thinking it would have... Uh, a benefit in terms of reducing racial disparities. The Defender General's office um, has come in and pointed out ways that it could have a disparate impact, a, a negative impact. Um, ORE came in today and testified about how they think we just need more time. And so I think that, you know, there's valid arguments on both sides about whether this bill is, is a, a benefit or or could cause some disparate impacts. And they would be unintended, but still disparate, so and negative. So we don't want that, right? So however, this from the get-go, this has a been been a bill that's a priority of the attorney general to try to improve our record clearance laws. So now if we're gonna have a vote on whether the RDAP writes a letter that would essentially like halt the right. bill, and I can't talk to the attorney general, I mean the attorney general very well could be like, well, this is a really important part of the process that needs to happen. But right now it's 7.30 p.m. and you have to testify tomorrow, Aton, and we're talking about a letter that would be sent to House Judiciary during the week of crossover. So process-wise, this is just tricky for if we're going to start voting on this letter <laughs> and not to diminish the importance of equity, uh, racial equity impact assessment happening on all these criminal justice bills. Really, really appreciate that point and the importance of that. I just want to be transparent about the position I am now sitting in on this panel. I mean, everybody's always multiply compromised. That's that's just how it is, I think. But okay, so I'm writing a letter inviting chair and vice chair judiciary, chair and vice chair, I mean, sorry, Senate judiciary, House Judiciary, so four people, right? Then I, and I'm going to say, you know, talk about that's what we were supposed to do. 
it's not happening. We need a better pipeline. Would you please come and talk to me? Then I'm, Rebecca, your point, right? Okay, that's one letter. Now, do you want an you want another letter then to go? I don't know where joint judicial oversight about stopping this that this is going so quickly that the RGAP in fact doesn't have time to look at all of this does that mark I don't think you should use any language that suggests you're stopping anything <clears throat> um I, th I think that's that's a tr that's another disaster um, because you're going to scare the hell out of a lot of people and you're also going to piss a lot of people off. Um, I, I, okay. think, I think it's really a matter of just slowing it down. Because um, Aaron, is, as much as what Aaron said is true and, and completely understandable, I mean, it's, you know, like mad practical what she just said. But what the Attorney General's office doesn't understand is, is what this policy uh, combined with the full effect of all of the other policies in 176, 534, 58, 655, blah, 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 you know, what that, what that impact is going to be. I don't think anybody does. No, I, right. So, but I'm so not going to, but the one thing is, Mark, we're not going to get that much in the weeds because not all, everybody on the panel has gone through all of that. Well, staying out of the weeds, I'm just, all I'm really saying is, is that, you know, the, the language shouldn't be um, stop. It should be delay uh, until such time as uh, the aforementioned review uh, and the analysis could be conducted in the the uh, language is in your uh, email right now. Okay, thank you very much. Rebecca and Sheila also have it. Grand. Okay, I will I will get on this um, uh, soon. <laughs> very, very soon. Rebecca. And your question as to the, an additional letter, I, I was just suggesting that the letter be filed with the Judiciary Committee, House Judiciary Committee, so it is in addition to your testimony or statements on these two bills tomorrow, uh, this week. Oh! Uh, General <laughs> statement of, of what your, as was I under, what I understood you to say you were going to talk about tomorrow and when you- Well, I was going to talk about it. I wasn't going to write about it. That's yeah. all. But you think I- I got to be honest. I, I I have no time to write between now and tomorrow morning. <laughs> that's I understand. Not. That's fair. <laughs> that's yeah, just that's... not just can't happen. I'm afraid. Um, I will. I'll speak tomorrow morning, and I'll write after that, and tell them that you know that I'm submitting this this letter about the pipeline need for a pipeline i mean you know and that in other words it's a written down version of what i'm writing to the four legislators broader and yet not as specific like we need you here next month okay right cool all right uh whoo uh what are we up to 176 but we don't really have to have that conversation because it's moot now we're not going to do it as a panel um so we don't have to do that last part you're supposed to be happy go ahead rebecca <laughs> I, to all, I would only address that because we did mention it in our report <laughs> To the extent that there is uh, already a filing referencing that, I do think it's a moment, but it's a, only if it's just a moment to say we put it in our report, which you haven't invited me in to talk about yet, right? Um, I don't know. Right. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just bringing that. That's that's the one little tiny difference of H176 as opposed to all the others we've been talking about. Today. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, that's fine. I can say that tomorrow. I'll remember that. I can say that. Um, no, that's fine. And then we'll go on to the letters after that. All right. On it. I will do it. So that kind of is all we have for tonight. Like that was really easy. Uh, <laughs> um, 
anything else anyone wants to bring up under sort of like new business, anything of that sort? We've sort of been there, but there may be more. No? Oh, Tim, go ahead. I, I just business. wanted to say, um, you know, thanks to everybody for the last, I've been on here for now October 2022. And since I started and learned a lot, um, enjoyed getting to know some of you. And um, you all should have my email, my cell phone. Aton knows that I will respond to communications at most hours of the day and night. So um, if it's ever a question or something that feels like it's in the realm of state's attorneys, et cetera, that you just want to talk about, et cetera, I, I'm, I'm here, a resource um, for you all and uh, appreciate the work you're doing here. And and um, I'm having Frazana and Aton do a, a play date to say hello and introduce them and themselves to each other out of the session. We're going to meet in White River or something like that. Um, and, um, you know, if there's anything that you all want me to pass along to, to Farzana as, a, as the new appointee, um, just let me know. Um, and thanks for all your, your work. And, you know, I'm here. So thank you all. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Mark, did you have something that you wanted to throw yeah. in? We're sort of, okay. We have offered testimony on PR4, the Constitution yes. uh, uh, that seeks to create a, um, a new article for uh, equal protection. Right. So I wanted to make, I think this body is very important that this body yes. gets it. Aaron, Aaron, you and I have already started uh, conversations about this. Um, so we found consensus with the Human Rights Commission, uh, the Office of Racial Equity, uh, the ACLU, uh, as well as Professor Teachout, uh, that the amendment should stand as a separate article. Uh, that, okay. that's, uh, there's an example in PR4 in 2019, and I just um, wanted to let you know is that it's important that the language be um, refined to ensure that we are able to memorialize the intent of the constitutional amendment to ensure that the, the foundation, there's a foundation that supports a clear path uh, to an option for evolving state, uh, state jurisprudence on equal protection uh, in Vermont. Uh, existing federal jurisprudence on equal protection is, is the floor and the state jurisprudence would be the ceiling. Uh, so um, systemic racism and other forms of systemic oppression, obviously they're creating the wealth disparities and indirectly affecting the health and the welfare and threatening the economic growth and development uh, and ultimately placing democracy at risk here uh, in the state. Uh, so this amendment is really gonna serve as the foundation uh, for expanded protections. Right. Uh, they include the development and the use of uh, state equal protection okay. doctrine that could ensure the survival of governmental solutions designed to redress discriminatory policies and so, practices and correct disparate outcomes. Right. Uh, this is also to uh, sustain against attacks on existing protected civil rights uh, and support the expansion of protections of and uh, to additional classifications as needed. Uh, so okay. these protections are going to also include the tools, hopefully to thwart the emerging challenges of discriminatory algorithms and old harms that the federal protections have proven ineffective. So the reason why it's super important here is, is again, this goes across prosecution and defense, as well as the bench. Uh, this, this, it's very uh, critical that we get the testimony that we need in on this, even if you disagree with it, show up and testify. They're going to be trying to vote this thing out of um, out of uh, Senate um, judiciary on Friday. I said vote out on Friday, and this constitutional amendment you must you must understand it must clear the Senate and the House right before the before mid May right, and and that includes a um, a public hearing because that's that is the protocol and and we also that's the constitutional requirement in the house it must have a public hearing and it has to stay on schedule for five days as a constitutional amendment so it's tight okay so, mark quick ask what do you want the rdap to do right now i would like those of you who represent the attorney general's office Aaron, uh for those uh who because the attorney general is the one who's going to have to defend this if if uh if it becomes a constitutional amendment first of all so that's most important uh, so we haven't, I haven't heard anything from that office yet. I know we've talked about it, but I think 
I think those who are represented from the Superior Court, as well as state's attorneys as, and defender general's offices should, should be chiming in on what it is uh, we're trying to do here, good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. That's the long way of saying, please support the constitutional amendment. Yeah, no, got that part. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, Sheila. Um, I just wanted to bring up a different subject. Sorry for my darkness. I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, uh, I wanted to know if we'll be discussing or if we can put on the agenda maybe for the next time of the um, Vermont Department of Children and Families um, initiative to build the 27 beds for the youth. And I'm really wondering about what our interest is in that conversation and specifically looking at the disparities that could create the history of Woodside and the history of systems like that with our youth in general. So I'm very, um, I'm very curious to have a conversation with this group because I feel like some issues might come up later, uh, later in this process. And I know there are people here representing DCF and I feel like we often keep on moving away from ju juvenile justice and really want to make sure we're continuing to focus on that area. Okay. Uh, I would love to have conversation about uh, DCF's intentions of, you know, building residential bed space. So if that's the, if that's great. the area of topic that we'd like to discuss, I'm, I'm happy to bring that. Would someone just shoot me an email to remind me that I need to put that on the agenda? Just like, you know, a dumb little, hey, you. <laughs> You know, residential stuff, uh, you know, just something like that, and I'll remember then. Thank you. But we'll do that for next month, maybe. I'm hoping. Yeah, I could certainly prepare something for that. Cool. Good and groovy. We'll do. Thank you, Sheila. Yes, thank you. Um. Um. I. Oh, what, two other things I should have announced. Both witchy. And Singh, as you'll remember, Singh, um, have asked to resign from the RDAP. They are both um, appointments from the Office of Racial Equity. So Susanna is on it now, um, looking for their replacements for us. Okay? So there's that. Um, I can't really tell you much about this, about why. Um, other, you know, other things that they need to be worried about and concerned with and such, um, was pretty much what I got. And so there's, there's nothing I'm like holding back really. Um, but you should all know that. Um, hey, all right. Uh, yes. Uh, Who? Will you, what? Please, uh, will you please share to them? I mean, I'll reach out individually, but thanks um, on behalf of the panel. I will. I shall do that. Well, yes. Further work and contributions there will be missed. Absolutely will. Absolutely will. And Are that's all. Kind of, sorry. Are you doing any kind of exit uh, interviews with those folks? I had not planned to. I'm just trying to keep my head above water at this point. Uh, super productive for. I, yes, I do know. Um, I would actually have to ask if someone else wants to take that on, if they do it. I have no more discretionary time. Does Do we have a certain process or questions or template or anything that, that we have to be able to do that? Or is this something that we should have been doing from the onset that's being brought up that we'd have to create a system for? Well, it's not really creating a system so much as it we would we would definitely need a list of things to ask. We would need, you know, uh and it would, I mean, there are templates for such things, but this is a rather specific committee. So I don't think any of those would work. Um, we definitely would need something um that would be tailored to the RDAP. Perhaps it would be worthwhile if next time we meet also we can discuss Recording what our stopped. thoughts are for a list of questions that could go into that. And then sure. whoever administers exit, I think it's a great idea to have an exit 
I do too. I think it's wonderful. It, it, it just, I, I just am at my limit right now. Well, then we can share responsibility. Yes, on that. that would be wonderful. Um, uh, great. Are we there then? I have nothing else to bring before you. Bye, Mark. Bye. No? Okay. Um, then let's just be done with that adjournment part and not worry about voting at us. That's out. Everybody can just go have dinner now. <laughs> Thank you very much, all of you, for everything, um, as always. Um, Sheila, certainly for you to bring me off this, you know, ledge when I'm like, but we have to make sure the trains run on time. And you're like, well, you know, there might be a calmer way of doing that. And I'd be like, oh, really? What an interesting thought. <laughs> so, uh, which was what I was referring to in the letter. Um, and uh, everybody else for everything that you've allowed me to put into the letter because of your commitment and your dedication and um, clarity of thought, frankly, which it, it made it very easy. It, it's very easy to write in behalf of, on behalf of this body. And uh, that's all you, that is all you. So thank you. Um, and so with that, I will see you in April. Um, I'll be in touch before then. And tomorrow I'm going to tell them nothing. <laughs> not nothing, but you know what I mean. They're not going to get their question answered. So um, that's okay. That's as it should be, I think. So, all right. Grand. Good night. Yeah.